Hello, everybody. Welcome to week three of Women, Power, and Leadership. This week, we're going to focus on the leadership part. And since we've been talking about wearing the shirt, I, I, and that's a big part of women and leadership, I thought I would share with you my own favorite shirt, which is well-behaved women rarely make history. I also want to do a quick review with you of the five classic points of power that we've, uh, you've read in the textbook, we've talked about in the discussion board, and just as a starting place for, for this week, uh, we're going to expand on this quite a bit because we're going to end up changing the definition of power, but these five classic definitions of power or kinds of power remain useful constructs for us to, to have in any case. Coercive, reward, legitimate, expert, and reference. So if you need to refresh your memory on those, just go back to the textbook and, and reread that part. Because what I want to focus on today is how we can build upon those, those uh, classic definitions of power and change how we think about power. We need to literally change how we think about power. And we're going to make that change in three specific ways. First, just to realize that power is amorphous. It is like a hammer. You can build something with it or you can break something apart. It's all about what you do with it. And that's why it's really not, doesn't make much sense for women to resist having power because we can demystify it by realizing it's just whatever we make it. Secondly, we need to recognize that what's holding us back is recognize, is what's holding us back can be um, better understood by understanding the difference between ambition and intention. At the core of those dismal statistics that I showed you earlier, you know, about how, for example, women are almost 60% of college graduates, but we hold only 18% only of the top leadership positions, and we earn 77 cents to men's dollar, all those dismal statistics that I showed you and talked with you about in a previous lecture, I think that the biggest difference between men and women is, is behind those statistics is not in our ambition, which is the desire to do or be, but in our intention, which is to know you can and you're setting forth to do or be something or someone specific. And let me elaborate on that just a little bit. It's really about, it really gets back to how we think about our own worthiness or our own place in the world. And you know, when I was interviewing the heads of all of the organizations that help women run for office now, and there are now dozens of them spending millions of dollars and training thousands and thousands of women, and they've hardly moved the dial. Uh, at the rate we're going, it will take 70 years to reach parity in politics, and even more so in the workplace. But when I interviewed the heads of these organizations that try to help women run for office, every one of them said the same thing. They all said, you know, a man will get up in the morning, he'll look at himself in the mirror, and he'll say, I think I want to run for Senate, I'm going to do that. He will not question his qualifications. He will not question whether he's worthy. He will just go do it. A woman may say, I'm interested in politics, and maybe I'd like to run one of these days. But first, I had better learn a few things. First, I think I'll take some courses. Maybe I'll work in a campaign or two. You know, I want to really know that I'm doing it right when I do it. That's the fundamental difference. And it goes back to how you're socialized. Because even today, the world is basically men's oyster, and they know that from the time they draw their first breath. But women are still supposed to be the perfect pearl. Women have just as much ambition as men. We will aspire to almost anything if we think our kids need it or if we see an injustice. And again, to give you an example from politics, um, I like to tell the story of Senator Patty Murray in Washington State, who, who had no intention of running for office, wouldn't have done it for the, the, the power of it. But she became so incensed when her state senator 
voted against funding for her child's kindergarten, that she ran for office, beat him, and then went on to become a United States senator. So the first big change that we need to make in our thinking about power is to recognize that what's holding, holding women back has to do not so much with ambition as with intention. And that's the first big change, in our, the second big change we need in our thinking about power, and that is to remind ourselves to walk with intention. But the third and biggest change we need is in defining our own terms about power first. And in doing that, we can change the power paradigm in ways that will be good for everybody. We're changing that from the old outdated idea of power over to the much more expansive power to. Changing the definition of power because power throughout most of human history has been a concept rooted in brute force, the power over something or someone. And because women have usually been among those over whom the powerful rule, it's no wonder that when we think about power, we imagine negatives. Women's bodies have been restricted, raped, and beaten by men. Why would we want to emulate that kind of brute force? So that's why we call power over women sexism. And sexism is just a form of humiliation used to assert the power over. And that's what we're trying to sweep out of our thinking, our baby elephant thinking, and come into the world um, thinking about power too as a much more positive thing. A power over implies forcing or denying. Power too is about solving problems. It's about innovating. It's about possibilities. And, and women will say, oh yes, I want that kind of power. That's when women decide they're a perfect 10 or maybe at least a nine. Power too is an infinite resource. Whereas power over implies that it's a finite pie. And if I take a slice, there's less for you. But really, it, it, there, there, is no, there is no limit to the amount of power that can exist. Um, and the more there is, the more there is. Power over makes you feel powerless. Power to makes you feel powerful. Power over, therefore, is oppression. And power to is leadership. And I believe that this kind of power to definition of power, of the, which is leadership, that is the transformational leadership and the paradigm change in power, in defining power, that is the kind of leadership that women can bring to the world and that the world today is crying out for. It's the secret sauce that makes more money for companies and makes the parliaments work better. It is not the end of men, but it is the beginning of women, and specifically of women reaching power, reaching parity in leadership, if we so choose. If we can release those negative connotations and baby elephant thinking that make us wary of power, and if we can give ourselves the freedom to envision a world where women can lead with integrity, intention, and confidence. Now, if power to is leadership, then we need to define what leadership is. I have a very low-tech definition of leadership. I mean, I, I think that a leader is somebody who gets things done. Now, often when I say that, people will come back at me and say, well, yes, but a leader has to get something done through other people. And that, that's absolutely true. But the point is that the leader gets it done. And because I think there are too many books and articles that tell women what's wrong with us, uh, maybe even what's wrong with our with us as leaders. My goal is to explain the context, and then I want to give women, and I want to give people in this class on women power and leadership, and and I think these all apply to men just as much as they do to women. But but uh, I, I want to make sure that women have these power tools because a leader's gotta have her power tools. So I want you to have these as we go. You, I want you to have these nine power tools that we talk about in No Excuses as you go through this course. What would you want to use your power tools for? Do you want to be 
on the United States Supreme Court, like like uh, Sylvia Sotomayor? Do you want to be a race car driver, like Danica Patrick? Do you want to run for office, like this woman who has who is wearing the shirt? Even if you think you don't have the power to lead, you do. You do. This woman really had very little power. Women were the lowest of the low in general in Liberia when Lema Gabawi began to decide that she wanted to get something done, and therefore she became a leader and used her power too. And um, Liberia was at the time ruled by a, a despotic, despotic dictator, Charles Taylor, um, it, it was. It had been in a civil war for many years. It had destroyed. That had destroyed the economy, and Taylor would recruit all many of the young boys as early as ten or eleven years old into the army, and they became child soldiers. Gabawi didn't want that to happen to her children, and she tried to figure out what to do about it, and so she created a movement, and she brought together women of all faiths. And they got together and they said, we have no power. How can we stop this dictator? And then they realized that if they all joined together, they would have a great deal of power. And so these women went to the marketplace every day for almost a year. Now, the, the shops in the market were actually run by these women. So they decided they would not open their shops. And by doing that, they shut down the economy even further. They said they wouldn't have sex with their husbands. That was a pretty powerful thing. And so for a year, every day, they would go sit in the marketplace. They would not open their stores. They would not have sex with their husbands. Every day they sang, they prayed, they said, we want this war to end. We want the dictator to leave office. After a year, in fact, he, he not only left office, the civil war was ended, but this paved the way for Ellen Johnson Sirleaf to become the first female president of an African country. So you see, even if you think you don't have the power to, the power to lead, you actually do. You just have to figure out what it is. What do you have the power to? Define your own terms, communicate your value, own your expertise, and take action each day to create your new, your unique vision. Because the world is waiting to hear from you. Trust me on that one. Take just a moment to think about your power used. What power can you use or do you use? And write down the three points of power that you have in any of these areas, whether it's personal, workplace, or political, or, or civic and community life. This is not for you to share with anybody else, just to do a personal affirmation. Take a few minutes and do that. And as you do, I want to conclude this lecture for week three of Women, Power, and Leadership with a quote from Katie Orenstein, the founder of the Op-Ed Project, who I told you about in the previous lecture, uh, who's helping women learn to write and pitch and not uh, pitch uh, opinion, pace, opinion pieces to the major newspapers and not to be deterred when they are rejected, but to keep pitching and keep pitching. She says, it's important for women not just to have the power to choose, but to choose power. And if anybody deserves to have the last word in this, it would be the late great member of Congress from New York, Bella Abzug, and one of the founding second wave feminists who said, we want it all, but we'll take half.